welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're chatting about the farming of aquatic animals and plants with, spe- with special guests. George Chamberlain, president of the Global Seafood Alliance in New Hampshire. Jim Parsons, board president of the National Aquaculture Association. And Sebastian Bell, executive director of the Maine Aquaculture uh, Association. Thank you all for joining I have so been looking forward to this discussion because as in the lead up to this, uh, I've been doing so much reading and I feel slightly educated. And now I get to talk with uh, the masters of the profession and and, uh, through you, uh, your staffs and your constituents. So I'm just going to set this up because this was just fascinating. Uh, Fish and seafood aquaculture is a 1.9 billion industry in the US. And this was the thing that got me. 17th, we're 17th in the world in terms of aquaculture production. And Asian countries led by China dominate. Um, We're having an issue in the world because wild fish populations are being caught faster than they can reproduce and there's increased pressure on marine stocks as harvesting tech, pollution, global warming, and so on and so forth, climate change, the shifting of environments, uh, which are causing animals to migrate to different areas. Um, All of it is affecting uh, aquaculture. George, let's start with the global picture and and the uh, Global Seafood Alliance. Could you give us a sense of the state of aquaculture in the world today? Well, well, I sure would love to, uh, Mark, and thanks for inviting me. And let me tell you a little quick snapshot of the Global Seafood Alliance. We were founded in 1997, and our initial role was to try to dispel some exaggerations and myths, myths, mistruths about aquaculture and so some of the damage it was causing. But then we soon realized that actually, although the exaggerations weren't true, aquaculture had a lot of room to improve. So we began developing certification standards for each of the links in the value chain, the hatchery, the farm, the feed mill, and the processing plant. And today we certify about 3 billion pounds of seafood around the world. And we're supported by most of the major retail and food service company names that you would recognize, like um, Walmart and Kroger and Albertsons and Publix and on and on. So, George, uh, I just have a question about this. There is very often this debate about regulation, even self-regulation, right? Standards, right? Why, Why should we be, quote, imposing things on it on an industry That's uh, a, standards so could you just sort of describe why the industry itself and and the consumer the entire value chain from those who supply the feed or or those who are uh, raising the the fish to those who are distributing it all the way to the retail outlets and the consumers why some sort of rule setting is in everybody's interest and actually strengthens an industry in this particular case Yeah, I think the issue here is that seafood is the most internationally traded protein in the world. It's coming from dozens of countries around the world and many, many different species. And each of those countries varies in its regulatory framework and its enforcement capability. And so a, a retailer is faced with bringing in product from all over the world and not really being sure of its provenance, its uh, production methods, for example, whether there were social issues, child labor, food safety issues, um, for example, antibiotics used or harmful chemicals, or whether the environment was disrupted. Was, um, was uh, for example, was the Amazon impacted Uh, by cutting down forests to grow soybeans to make this feed for this product. There are so many issues and such complexity that it's important to have overarching standards and sort of a level playing field that um, uh, allows retailers and food service companies to be confident of their brand and their corporate social responsibility. They can stand behind the environmental, social, food safety, and, and animal welfare uh, aspects of their product. So in, in this case, we develop standards, but let me make it clear that, you know, the certification standards uh, promulgating groups don't do audits. Those are separate 
third party ISO certified bodies that uh, send out the inspectors to check for compliance with standards. And Jim, how do you see the situation from a national association uh, perspective? Thank you, Mark. When, when we look at uh, this from the National Aquaculture Association standpoint, we realize that the U.S. aquaculture community is one of the most heavily regulated farming communities in the world. And the number of uh, regulations that we have to meet and the variety of different agencies that we deal with is fairly unique. Um, so our outlook on this, and we do have many members that also choose to adopt standards by the, by the third party uh, certifiers, but we believe that U.S. farm raised, there's almost no better certification in the world than saying our aquaculture products are, are U.S. farm raised. Do you feel that, that the, um, the network of regulations are rational on a federal level, or are there also uh, regulations on a state and local level that, are, uh, th that result in uh, conflicts, com unnecessary complexity, um, the necessity to navigate uh, beyond what would be reasonable for a business to do? It, it's very unique. We have an ongoing uh, task underway by National Aquaculture Association that's supported by various institutions as well as ours to look at the, the cost of regulation on the U.S. aquaculture farms in the United States. And we've looked at various sectors and it's, it's very high. It, it represents a high percentage of the costs of doing business in this country. But that said, we also know that that also allows us to produce a high quality product. It's so diverse. It's like, like saying we regulate agriculture. Well, there's so many different species. We're in marine, brackish, freshwater environments. And, and there is a lot of complexity based on how our farms have to work. And Sebastian, I'm so glad that, that you're able to join us today. You know, Maine is a such an interesting state, right? You have the eastern part of Maine, the northern, southern, and, and the, the state itself has different characters. The marine element of, of Maine's history uh, looms so large. And with the environmental shifts that we've been reading about in the newspaper and the, and the movement of fisheries, I was wondering uh, about your perspective on how uh, Maine is being impacted, and also it would be great to just chat a little bit about the environment, the state environment in which um, in, in which people in uh, aquaculture uh, need to operate, and how that functions in these changing times. Sure, thank you, Mark. Well, I'll start by saying that the the Maine state seal has two characters on it. One is a merchant mariner, and the second is a farmer. And our members uh, who grow in the water are the merging of those two traditions. Um, and so really our members represent the new face of the working waterfront in the state. We have a, a strong uh, commercial fishery in the state. Um, but if you look at the people who are going into aquaculture, many of those are the sons and daughters of fishermen or the fishermen themselves because they can't get permits um, because the fisheries are closed. And so uh, aquaculture makes a lot of sense for our state in, in terms of continuing those traditions. I think the, the biggest interesting thing, and this goes back to what George was talking about earlier, is that, um, as you know, we import most of the seafood we consume in this country. Um, and if you compare that to other proteins, turkey or poultry or beef or, or, or uh, swine, we grow most of those other proteins in this country that we consume in this country. But in the case of seafood, that's not the case. And so as domestic producers, as domestic farmers, we are competing against farmers from other countries. And as George alludes to, um, they often have different regulatory uh, contexts. And so for us, um, the emergence of international standards that level the playing field are really important because essentially that, that helps us uh, compete uh, and it raises the bar for farmers in other countries um, so that they have to uh, begin to aspire to the kinds of regulatory uh, context that we have here in this country. It's a, it's a good evolution, I think, over time. And certainly uh, George's organization has been really important in the, the development of that. 
The other thing I think which is interesting about Maine is we probably have the most diverse aquaculture sector of any state in the country. Um, we have roughly 190 farms, but we grow finfish, shellfish, and seaweed. We grow freshwater and saltwater. We grow on land in recirculating systems and in the ocean. Um, it's a very diverse group of companies and one that uh, is growing uh, pretty steadily. We've been uh, experiencing very steady growth over the last 15 or 20 years. And um, that's kind of exciting from an economic development point of view and from the viability of coastal communities that up until relatively recently were really dependent on tourism as, as the only um, kind of big economic driver aside from the commercial fisheries. So aquaculture is playing a pretty important role in, in Maine right now. How important is it that we as consumers become more educated? You know, I'm kind of embarrassed. Um, although I'm, I'm I'm a wonky guy, and I, I've I've had my interactions with uh, organizations like the Packard Foundation that talk about sustainable uh, fisheries, and various um, uh, well uh, leaders like yourself. I have to say that I'm mostly ignorant. When I go to the store, I, I don't really know what I'm buying. I don't know where it comes from. Um, I have no idea what the environmental uh, impact is. When I go to restaurants, I'm trying to shift my consumption habits, uh, try to, um, to purchase uh, seafood that I believe is sustainably harvested, but I'm not really sure. Um, how much does, does the ignorance of the American consumer, people like myself, uh, play in, in your world? And is there a way to shift um, and, and to somehow increase the knowledge that we have amongst restaurant chefs who are uh, taste leaders, among retail outlets? Um, how do you all function with the, with the last point in that distribution chain that interfaces with me, whether it's a restaurant or, or uh, a, you know, a Costco or, or, or my local uh, supermarket gym? How does, how does that work? Or is that uh, less part of your world? Consumer education is expensive, Mark, and uh, that's the challenge each of our organizations faces. Um, and George, I'm sure we'll talk about how uh, they've handled it. From our perspective as a state association, um, we form strategic partnerships with other groups that are in the food uh, um, business. And so we, we do a lot of cooperative work with uh, agricultural groups. We do a lot of co cooperative groups, uh, cooperative work with the commercial fishing sector. Um, but as a relatively small group of farmers, it's very difficult to generate the, the level of funding that's needed to really do consumer facing um, marketing. So we really we really rely on uh, the interpreters, if you will, the chefs and the, the restaurant owner associations and, and those kinds of organizations to tell our story. Well, and Maine is a great place for that because the relationship between that that front line, the opinion leaders, and the people who actually uh, cultivate, grow, and so on, uh, uh, produce or fish or whatever is, is, is closer. Jim, uh, do you care to comment in terms of what you're doing over the Nas uh, National Association? I think just, you know, it's important to recognize the, the importance of seafood for America in general. We don't eat enough when you look at health, health problems in this country and and the, the types of protein and diets that we eat, we need to be eating more seafood. And so when, when we look at this picture, um, often we get, we get squared up against wild caught fisheries or, you know, and there's a big debate, should we eat farm, should we eat wild? We're gonna need every bit of seafood that we can generate, whether it's wild caught or farm, uh, just to meet our needs as we move forward as a country. And I think that's the important message is consumers can, should educate themselves, should look at the science from, and we try to make that available in, in digestible bits that don't confuse people. Because if there's too many questions, when you get to the seafood case, it's very easy to look and say, oh, I'm just going to buy a chicken, you know, and, and we want to get away from that. We want to make sure consumers recognize the value of seafood, whether it be wild caught or farm. George, uh, can, can, can we delve in a little bit in, into a micro uh, issue that I think Jim's, uh, Jim's response begs, and that is the relationship between wild and, uh, and farm and the, the effect of, of farm on wild and, and vice versa. There have been uh, uh, reports uh, periodically in the media, particularly in the salmon fisheries, about how um, there, there can be um, 
a DNA level transmission that might harm wild fisheries and so on. Can you just comment about the interactions between wild and caught and, and how um, uh, we can preserve the biodiversity that is outside of the fishery environment, but also end up uh, exploiting um, resources like ocean uh, areas or, or, or lakes or whatever uh, for, uh, for raising uh, uh, fish in, in uh, cultivated circumstances. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think before I begin, would you mind if I comment on the previous question just for a Please. moment? Okay, uh, when it came to consumer awareness within the, the GSA Global Seafood Alliance and our certification program, we provide a mark on the consumer packaging, on retail packaging, so a consumer can tell if the product is certified. But actually, I would have to say that in the early days, most consumers have not been very aware of uh, sustainability issues, and it's more of a B2B, business to business uh, issue. Major buyers, like, um, for example, a Walmart, they set sustainability goals, their, their chairman, their board of directors, and down to their buyers. And those buyers are very aware of the issues and they work directly with certification programs to make sure the products they provide meet their criteria. But it's moving toward the point where the eco labels are recognized by consumers. And where we see that going is QR codes on the final packaging that will allow the consumer to click on that with their phone, see the full provenance, where it came from, the sustainability credentials, and more importantly, the product story. You know, here's a picture of the farmer. Here's how it was raised. You know, here's a map of where it came from, and all that stuff is coming. That that data is being treated like grapes and wine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and you know, even to the point. Imagine um, looking at a nutritional label and seeing, okay, here's the total fat, carbohydrate, and sugar, and so forth, cholesterol, and here's the greenhouse gas emissions per serving size. You so know, that's, that's coming. You can, you can have an impact on, on the climate if you, it, certainly if you care about what's going on um, in, in, in our climate, uh, you can have an impact there, but you can also have an impact on your health because these, uh, these protein sources are shown to be far more healthy than the, uh, the fat saturated red meats that we here in the United States uh, eat too much of, right? Right, and, and then just to, Mark, just to address the question you actually asked me, <laughs> I think there are several, several impacts. You know, one uh, is a concern about escapes from, uh, from farmed uh, operations, particularly those that directly farm in the ocean. There's a potential for, you know, genetic, um, let's call it contamination of a farmed and a wild species. So there's every effort made to prevent those escapes. And those escapes are progressively being more and more minimized over time. Another, another interaction is that a lot of feed for farm species in, includes marine ingredients, fish meal that's captured from the wild. And so there are limits and metrics measuring what's called the fish in, fish out ratio or the efficiency of converting those wild marine organisms into the final aquaculture product. And that's carefully monitored and steadily improving over time. So those metrics are, are being measured and um, the impacts will always be there, but it's a question of trying to monitor them and continuously improve. So, uh, just make go ahead, go ahead. on that, I think, um, because this is something that we've dealt a lot with in, in our part of the world. Um, 
I think one of the mistakes that we made as, a, as an industry early on, and, and by this I mean 30 years ago, was not admitting that we were having impacts and acknowledging that. And so our take on it has been to actually go to the environmental community and to work with them to develop the standards that we then comply with and, and to frankly admit that we have the potential of having impacts and that we as farmers have a responsibility to acknowledge that and then work to minimize that. And I think that's really where you're seeing most of the responsible farming organizations going in aquaculture right now is, is headed in that direction, working with the environmental community and acknowledging that there are impacts and trying to uh, focus on minimizing those from a solutions point of view, not from a, a problems point of view. You know, this is such an important point. We've actually seen in the last 20 years a real shift. It used to be that the environmental community and the farming community, whether agriculture or other farming uh, communities, were at loggerheads. And now we're seeing a, a real shift. As a matter of fact, we're doing a search for uh, the Ban Ki-moon um, uh, um, uh, uh, Global Center, and they focus on 17 sustainability goals. Years ago, that would have seen as, as kind of woo-woo, you know, pie in the sky, uh, uh, please don't regulate me, please don't whatever. Now we have a increased consciousness that we are affecting sustainability of our fisheries, for example, and we need to cultivate those, those fisheries, um, you know, pun intended, so that they, they can continue to provide those sources of protein that you all are, are talking about. Um, we do see some hope, though. We see, for example, that sixty uh, percent in our in our poll so that they do think about sustainability as uh, when they buy uh, seafood, which is a, a surprisingly large figure, uh, considering that I sometimes have not thought in, in that way, and I'm trying to change my own ways. And then, in terms of uh, priorities in our lives, we are seeing uh, quite a bit of focus on environmental and sociability for uh, social responsibility. 40% of, of people responding to our poll um, consider that animal welfare, uh, food safety, all the, all the issues that, that you all are raising, but taste, nutrition, and other attributes, in other words, our selfish interests uh, still trump that. So let's talk about what the future uh, should bring for aquaculture. How do we continue to evolve in this country, I take it you're not going to all be um, uh, supporters of just a lot more regulation, right? So how do we create a better situation going forward that um, provides a rational environment in which uh, uh, aquaculture um, practitioners can uh, operate, but also um, creates this sort of sustainable world and is considering the environmental impact of what we're doing. Jim, you want to take a cut on this? Sure. You know, I think I think this is a really important point, you know, and touching on the last point as well, any food production system has an impact on the environment around which it's being farmed. And we've started to, to really look at aquaculture in the, in the global aspect of what is, our, what is our life cycle assessment? How do, we, how do we impact the environment for each unit of food that we produce? And we're beginning to see a lot of studies, independent studies come out that show we're on the right path. We need to keep improving. We can always improve. And I think that's one thing that aquaculture has been very good at. But we're, we are one of the lowest life cycle footprints for protein production of, of all the farming practices. And, and uh, I think that's a, that's a good place for us to start and we keep improving from there. George, what do you think in terms of, of, of how we should uh, continue to evolve on a global basis? Well, Mark, I, I think that there's a consensus that the way we do things now can't be directly scaled, that uh, food production systems already account for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. We're already seeing that uh, climate change is advancing and that we aren't moving quickly enough. We can't just scale up what we're doing. We have to find a different way, a more efficient way. Do you all agree, by the way, I'm, uh, uh, George, we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back. Do you all agree, do your members agree that we can't just scale? Because, you know, in, in, in American industry, there's been kind of a premise that you can just keep going and just grow. Do you know? I think, 
George makes a really important point. The one thing I would say is kind of a modifier is, you know, by world standards, most American aquaculture um, operations are relatively small. And so there may be opportunities to locally scale um, in order to increase production. But I completely agree with George in terms of we can't, we cannot continue to do business as we have been doing it. We need to, we need to innovate and decrease our, our per unit impact, if you will. Exactly. I, I, I wasn't implying that we don't expand. We can develop, we can produce more, we can probably double, but we need to do it in a way that generates a lot less impact per unit. That, that's the point. Can't scale the existing system. Sorry, you know, John. I think, I think aquaculture has been very successful in that. If you look even at food conversion ratios from where we were 40 years ago, um, where, where, you know, to now the very complex diets that are very scientifically formulated, and we've gotten the, the conversion of that feed down to protein very, very more efficiently. We, we just asked another, another question and uh, I'm, I'm gonna go around the room uh, one more time. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, start with you, George, uh, on the global side, we'll go to National Gym and then Sebastian, we're gonna give Maine the last word. But um, this, this poll was really interesting. We asked in terms of importance to nation, ha, nations, how important is agriculture to the world? And we gave three different um, options, and the answer that came out was surprising. We said major concern of international and national urgency, important but not requiring the attention of heads of states or their cabinets, um, among the issues and, and not requiring uh, government involvement. Fully 71% said that it is, it is of international and national importance. That was a, that was a bit surprising. I actually had expected more uh, on the important side or among among one of the many issues. So it seems like the uh, messages of your organizations are getting through. Uh, George, uh, could you uh, take us out and then we'll go to Jim and, and uh, Sebastian, just sort of a, a last word in terms of what all of us, each of us can be doing in our daily lives to support your work and the work of your community. Um, in terms of shifting the reality surrounding sustainable agriculture. Yeah, I think we all have a responsibility. We all need to, to be aware of the products we, we consume and, and try to show preference for those that are produced sustainably. I think we can look at uh, the major retailers in the U.S. and they're already driving in that direction very aggressively. You know, Walmart's a perfect example they're, they've committed to move from a sustainable company, which is doing, trying not to do any harm to the next generation, keeping things as good as they are today, to being a regenerative company, actually making things better and conserving land and water resources. And that doesn't mean that Walmart's going to change the LED lights in their, in their stores, and that's it. They're going to force their entire supply chain to improve with them. And, and so all of us have a responsibility and the bar needs to keep going up over time as we continuously improve to these much tighter and tighter environmental requirements. Jim, what do you think we have to do in order to, uh, do we all have to think regeneratively? I think we all need to eat more seafood, first of all. And, <laughs> but, you know, I think just, just being aware as a consumer of what's in your seafood case, where it comes from, look for the labels, ask questions about it, ask if it's local, get to know some of the local aquaculture farmers in your area, go visit an aquaculture farm. You know, we, we keep hearing this, this misnomer that we all have factory farms out there. And actually it's very far from the truth. People are, aquaculture farmers are right in the water or down in the mud with their products and, and just get to know what we're doing out there. I think that's, that's so important that we have a closer connection to the people who are on the front lines producing the food for us and care about our quality. Sebastian, would you endorse that? Absolutely, and I just, I, I mean, I think George and, and Jim said it wonderfully. The only other thing I would add is, um, number one, eat Maine seafood, and number two, <laughs> um, encourage young people 
to come into the field, encourage young people to study math and engineering and science. And we need young, innovative uh, people to get into our field and to help us evolve over time in the direction that we've all talked about here. So encourage young people to go in to college, to university, and to um, become part of the field and, and help us innovate. I, you're all making such wonderful points. If I may, I'll add, I'll add one to ourselves. Our dollar is the funding that drives the development of the country and the world. So fund the things that we value. We might have to pay um, uh, a little bit more to have the world that we want as opposed to the world that we don't. So just changing ourselves, changing our thinking, changing what we buy is, is really an important part of this. George Chamberlain, president of the Global Seafood Alliance in New Hampshire, Jim Parsons, board president of the National Aquaculture Association, Sebastian Bell, executive director of the Maine Aquaculture Association. Please thank your people, your, uh, uh, the people who cultivate uh, our food, the people who distribute it, your members um, and, and your funders. It's just been wonderful that you've been able to share your expertise with us. We are in your debt. Thank you so much. Everybody stay safe and um, happy Thanksgiving if we, if we don't uh, connect again. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You.